Welcome everyone. My name is Ben Christensen and I'm the owner of Waterford Wine and Spirits and I'm here to present to you one of my absolute all-time favorite tastings which is sparkling wine. This is a tasting I love so much because rarely do people ever sit down and drink a series of sparkling wines. And what I think this means is rarely do people consider sparkling wine as thoroughly as they should. And the reason I say as thoroughly as they should is because I believe it gives one of the most pleasurable experiences that you can ever have in wine. And in fact, I can point this out to you as an example, because over the years, and we're about to enter the holiday season as we uh, tape this episode, over the years, anytime someone asks me on the floor of the stores what they should give as a gift, I say champagne. And they say, really? And I say, well, think about it. If you have a white wine drinker, they might say, oh, I don't drink red wine. The tannins give me a headache. If you have a red wine drinker, they might say, well, I don't drink white wine because it's not serious enough. But if you give a bottle of champagne, no one ever says, oh, I don't drink champagne. So it's a wonderful gift and it's a wonderful pleasurable experience. The other thing I would point out is that it's one of the most food friendly of all wines. I guarantee you that champagne fits with almost anything. And in fact, one of the most dramatic dining experiences I ever had in my life was eating a steak with Dom Perignon. It was a very old Dom Perignon, but it was an amazing thrill. And it's one that I try and repeat as often as I can. Now, if you're not in the mood for Dom Perignon and steak, the other thing I would point out to you is food pairings, sparkling wines fit just a plethora, but the best food pairings are often simply bar food. And I mean that totally seriously. If you've never had the pairing of potato chips and sparkling wine, potato chips and champagne, you absolutely need to try it. Popcorn and champagne, another amazing pairing partner. So sometimes the simplest and sort of the most soul-filled foods or junk food, if you will, pair incredibly well with sparkling wine. Now, with that, I'm gonna give you just the lay of the land as we start this. In person, I always like to do very robust tastings of nine wines plus a bonus if you come early. But on these virtual tastings, we thought maybe three wines would give you a chance to fully explore them and also give you a chance to taste them alongside me, if you wish, as a full set. If you're going to do that, you can simply go to the website and click on the tasting button and then use the coupon code SPARKLING to get 20% off of the three wines that we're tasting. So that's what we have here as a setup, three wines, and we're going to taste them back and forth. Now again, I really think this is a pleasurable experience, and I hope that I can convey that sparkling wines smell differently than one another and taste differently than one another, are exciting to have in this format, and then give all the reasons, or many of the reasons, for why they taste the way they do so that you can keep exploring sparkling wines. Now, two points of interest that I would point out to you that can go along with all of your sparkling wine drinking. First off, you'll notice that my robust staff has uh, gently sampled these bottles in order to check that they're not flawed. And indeed, they're not. I would suggest you do that. But more to the point, if you notice, we've drunk off some of the champagne or some of the sparkling wines, and I would suggest you do the same. I realize that pork, uh, cork pop is always super pleasurable to hear, but I would suggest that you treat champagne and sparkling wine like regular wine. And with that, I always find regular wine breathes, it opens up, it becomes more expressive as it's exposed to air. I would suggest to you that champagne, particularly old champagne, will do that as well. Old champagne, having not seen oxygen for many years, I promise you will freshen up and will get much more fruit uh, centric as it is exposed to air. So go ahead and open your sparkling wines early, just like you do all your other wines. Drink off a glass and get them moving with some air. The other thing you'll notice is we're tasting out of Riedel's white wine glass. And I would suggest to you that you drink all of your sparkling wines out of the white wine glass 
or even roll to whatever the dominant grape is, use that grape's glass, even if it's a big bowl. Now you'll notice a couple of things with that. First off, you'll notice that, I'm not sure how detailed we can see, but you'll notice that my wines, even though they were poured just before we started, the bubbles have fairly faded out of them. And I appreciate that, yes, that's going to happen. The bubbles will not have that same kind of sexy appeal as they're going up the flute. But on the other hand, here, if you take it and you smell it out of this glass versus a flute, one, you can't swirl a flute, so you can't get the full aroma. And indeed, champagne is like wine, so the aroma is a huge experience with it. Also, if you taste it and have it on the palate, the flute tends to deliver all of the liquid right to the back of your palate, where, of course, you just kind of get an acidic profile. I assure you, if you tried side by side, flute in a white wine glass or even a pinot glass, you're going to get more expressive character out of the wine glasses as opposed to the flute. The final thing I'd point out to you is if in your sparkling wine drinking, you go and go into restaurants or even at your home and ask your spouse for or significant other for a glass of sparkling wine served in a white wine glass, the restaurant tour will have no idea where to stop so you're going to end up with a pour maybe as big as that, or maybe they'll take it all the way to the top. And even though this glass looks small, this can hold a solid 12 ounces if they pour to the top, whereas regular flutes are three and a half. So yet another great reason to use a regular wine glass. So those are my pro tips for drinking. I hope you purchase some of the wines and can drink along. And let's dive in so we can keep this uh, <laughs> lecture tasting in the 30 minute range instead of my usual uh, 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 shaggy dog stories. So here, I wanted to do this as an intro to sparkling wine. Now as an intro to sparkling wine, you'll notice that I've weighted the sample wines really towards champagne. Two of them are champagne, one of them is a Prosecco. Why did I do that? Well, I wanted to do that because I think most people have a strong interest in champagne. Why is it so prestigious? Why is it uh, the, the, you know, the one that gets romanticized? Why is it so expensive? How is it made? But more to the point, I think worldwide, champagne is the reflection point for sparkling winemakers and also for people consuming it. So I wanted to start with a offering that really focuses on champagne. That being said, I don't want to ignore the larger world of sparkling wine. Indeed, out of the entire percentage of sparkling wine made in a year, only one bottle in 12 is champagne. So there's far more sparkling wine than champagne. So we're just going to use champagne as a, a starting off point, really to discuss how it's made, compare and contrast, and then with another wine that's made in a different way, and then we're going to go back and explore champagne again with the idea that in future tastings, we can feather out the whole wide world of sparkling wine. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and take a taste of this first one, which is Drapier's Carte d'Or. And it's a champagne, it's a champagne from the southern region of Champagne called Al. Now, even though we're gonna focus on tasting champagne, I wanna try and avoid really centering, uh, centering the lecture on champagne and more use it to, to piece together other things of the sparkling wine world. But we'll start by asking the question of what is champagne? Huh? Okay, and we're gonna use that because we're gonna fill in what is sparkling wine. Well, champagne is three things to my mind. First off, it's a place. It's a place in France. It's about 30 uh, minutes, uh, 45 minutes outside of Paris. So if you land in Paris and you wanna do a little vino tourism, it's an easy place to get to. It's not the most romantic place. It has a lot of battlefields in it and graveyards in it. And it's also fairly cool and wet and rainy. So it's not the most romantic place to visit, but it is a place, Champagne. What else do we mean when we say champagne? We, of course, mean it as a sparkling wine. So we've got that, and we'll explore that in a second. We also tend to talk about method champenois, and sometimes that gets translated worldwide to traditional method. 
either one you want to use, method champenois or traditional method, is a method of making sparkling wine that is traditional to the Champagne region. Many people think it was discovered by Dom Perignon. Uh, he was actually working to try and get the bubbles out of the wine, but we can leave uh, Dom Perignon and that myth alone for now. The final thing that Champagne is, is it's a set of laws. It's a set of French laws, EU laws, and now internationally recognized laws. In general, they establish things like yield, aging, uh, winemaking process, the geography structure of it, a protection to both champagne makers and also champagne consumers. So now that we know what champagne is, let's step back and think about the world's sparkling wines under method champenois or the traditional method, because this is what gives us a lot of the rich flavors that we have in champagne and in sparkling wine, I should say. Maybe before we leave that, I should talk a little bit about the Drapiers. Again, they're from the southern part of Champagne. There, it's slightly warmer than the northern part. I actually think it's a little bit of a neglected part of Champagne and a great place to be drinking. Here, it has some of the same soil types as actually Chablis, and it's almost all, not almost all, I shouldn't say, it's Pinot Noir country. So this Champagne is actually 80% Pinot Noir, which to me gives the real bold red fruit character to it, kind of a beautiful cherry. And it's got 15% Chardonnay and 15% Meunier. We'll come back to the blending and how the blending goes in just a little bit, but that gives you the intro to that wine. Okay, so I said one of the things about Champagne is the traditional method. Well, this is the method that most serious sparkling winemakers, or maybe serious is the wrong word here, sparkling winemakers who are making age-worthy sparklers use worldwide. So we're gonna transition it over to the sparkling wine method, and I'm gonna give you an idea of what's involved in the sparkling wine method, hopefully relating it down to that drapier and eventually down to our final wine, the Villemar. So where does the sparkling or the traditional method start? Well, it starts with something that's known as the base wine. Okay, what is the base wine? Well, interestingly enough, the base wine would be what all other winemakers in the world really consider finished wine. So all the bottles that surround me and are behind me would be a base wine to a champagne maker. So a base wine, it's a starting point. They've harvested their grapes, they've crushed them, it's gone through primary alcoholic fermentation, and if you wanted to, you could just bottle it and send it to market. But we're gonna do something different. Next, in the process of traditional uh, method winemaking, is we have the blending cuvee. Okay, now we'll analyze the blending cuvee in just a couple of minutes with that final wine. But what you can understand here is you're taking a blend of grapes. I mentioned three grapes for Drapier, and you're blending it into a cuvee. Drapier's blending cuvee was 80% Pinot, 15 Chardonnay, and 5% Meunier. So a blending cuvee. This is a fascinating area that gets a lot more complex, but we're gonna hold that for just a moment. Now, as a winemaker using traditional method, once you've established your blending cuvee, you're ready to take that base wine and turn it, start the process of moving it into a sparkling wine. And what you're next going to do is something that's known as, by the French word, which is triage. Now, triage is really quite simple, but I like holding it in, the Fran uh, in French. And triage is the addition of both yeast and sugar into the bottle of wine, right? So you've got a bottle, usually they're not labeled, and you've got the blending cuvee in it. You're going to, as a winemaker, generally it's done by machine, add a little bit more yeast and a little bit more sugar. Now I should point out a bit of confusion here. Alcoholic fermentation, primary fermentation, has already taken place. So what you're doing here is a second fermentation, a, fermentation, a secondary fermentation. The total idea of this secondary fermentation is to get bubbles. So this is what's going to make the bubbles. The yeast will of course, uh, excuse me, yeah, the yeast will of course eat the sugar 
and they'll produce a couple of byproducts. They'll produce a byproduct, which is more alcohol. And indeed in this process, champagne, uh, sparkling wine, I should say now, uh, sparkling wine will increase slightly in alcohol, about a percent, winemakers could push it further. Then they'll also create CO2. Now, because the bottle has been corked again, the CO2 is going to be trapped. Eventually, it'll get totally into the solution, and you'll end up with bubbles. The final thing that they make is they eventually die off, and they create which is what, that which is known as lees, and that becomes very important for flavors. So triage the addition of yeast and a little bit of sugar. Now, I said bottling and secondary fermentation. The next big step is frankly aging. Now, this is aging in bottle. So there are a couple different places where you can age champagne, and again, we'll hit them. But aging after triage is now it's sitting in bottle. Very unique to champagne to have a secondary fermentation and then the aging process go on. Well, what's going on during this aging process? The development and integration of the CO2, then eventually the yeast dying, lees, and the creation of lees, dead yeast cells, and over a period of time, the flavors alter. Now, those lees are what many champagne connoisseurs feel gives champagne its yeasty, toasty character, and I happen to believe that it's autolytic character. Also increase its depth and richness and powerfulness. Some champagne houses age a very long time on the lees. Uh, many of the famous ones you would know, like Bollinger, VRD series, Dom Perignon, Cristal, are aged for a long time on the lees in order to develop that rich toastiness, the robustness, and also the complexity for it. Well, how long does the aging have to be? In French law, the aging has to be 15 months. So that's a good amount of time. 15 months is a fairly substantial amount of time to sit and age on the leaves. I have to point out too that oftentimes I get a question of why is champagne so expensive? And of course there are many answers. The easiest one is it's priced at the level the market would bear. But another answer is this aging time period means that the rate of return for champagne producers, and we'll talk about small growers and their historical faction that goes on there, but the rate of return is often quite slow, meaning that after harvest, they don't generally just get their money back, and even after a year after harvest, they're still not able to sell their champagne. So that's a burden that they have to sit on, and thus prices rise. Now, after aging, and however long you want to age it as a producer, you have a process that's called disgorgement. Now, disgorgement is generally done by machines these days, but the entire idea of disgorgement is, over the time period that it's been aging on the lees, it's developed sediment. Most people who are drinking something bubbly don't want chunks floating in their bubbles and in their glass and having bubbly, chunky champagne. So producers have to have a way to get those lees out of there. The easy way that was discovered to do that is to take the bottle in its upright position where the lees would be on the base or the bottom and slowly over the course of many months, turn it upside down and also turn it. This is called riddling. It's a real romanticized process and you can go and buy yourself a riddling rack if you want. Some champagne houses still do it by hand. Some traditional uh, uh, houses, sparkling houses do it by hand. I actually haven't tasted much of a difference between hand riddled and gyro palette riddled, which is these big forklift machines that take it and do it for you. I haven't tasted much of a difference between the two. But in any case, the idea is the bottle gets turned upside down, the leaves fall from the bottom and go to the tip. Then what you do is you take the tip and you uh, dunk it in a very cold solution, usually a dry ice solution, freezes that little part at the top that has the yeast cells, you turn it back upright, you pop the cork, and I should mention that most champagne is aged under crown cork, the old uh, glass pop bottle corks, the, the pressure causes that little frozen part to shoot out, and then you bottle it under the cork that you experience every time you open a bottle of sparkling wine. 
Again, the process is mostly done by machine these days, and it's a clarification process, a way of getting your champagne clarified. There is an extra little step just before you put the cork back in, and that extra little step is what's known as dosage. Now, dosage is a little bit controversial, or when I started selling champagne actively 15 years ago was very controversial, but dosage is the addition of sugar, and simply that, the addition of sugar. Now, why would you be adding sugar into sparkling wine? Most sparkling wine regions are some of the coolest in the world, including Champagne, which means that they generally make really acidic wine. A way to balance the acid character of the wine is to add a little bit of sugar at the end, and that is dosage. That actually gives you all the different champagne terms of brut and extra brut and zero dosage and all of that stuff. I generally choose not to teach those because they are almost all entirely overlapping. So memorizing the terms doesn't help you read the labels anymore. Because the better way is that most producers, many producers, will simply put on the back of their bottles now what dosage they used. A real common dosage is eight grams per liter. And in fact, our dropier is at 6.5 grams per liter. So a little bit of sugar, hopefully to tame down the acid character of it. The final thing to do is then stick the cork in and a cork big enough to hold the pressure and send it out to market. So here you go the traditional method that producers use all around the world to make their sparkling wines. If we return to the Drapier just to take a, another quick taste of it and associate it here, the things I can think you can notice is that the base wines here, being Pinot Noir, show actually Pinot Noir fruit character. I mentioned cherry before and I think it has that brioche spice, it has that, and that comes from Pinot Noir. So even though it's uh, a blanc wine, it's uh, not red, I think it really shows its primary fruit character. The aging of the drapier is actually 36 months on the leaves, and I think that gives you its fairly full, robust mid-palate character. It's a rich drinking champagne, which I think complements the Pinot character really well. I think they have just masterfully combined the aging with the base wines. And then finally, with the dosage being at 6.5 grams per liter, a little bit, uh, a little bit less than what typical Veuve Clicquot is at eight grams per liter, here I think you get a sense of vivacity on the back of the palate. There's a drive and energy. So again, I think just a wonderful example of this process. Okay, so sparkling wine, the, this is the process they use in Champagne. It's the process that a lot of Californians, Australians, South Americans, people who are trying to make age-worthy sparkling wines use as well. But there are many, many other methods to get your wine to sparkle. And indeed, hopefully in further tastings, we'll explore them all. But I wanted to show you one that most people know, and I think most people have drunk, and that is Prosecco. So our second wine of this flight is Adami's Bosco de Grica Prosecco. Okay, since we have this method fresh in our memory, let's take and talk about what the difference is of the Prosecco method, or Charmant method, or Tank method. And I kind of like to use Tank because I think it's pretty descriptive. So we start in the same position uh, that we would. We have a base wine. Then we would use a blending cuvee. So again, in Prosecco, most of it is made with the grape Gela, uh, or Gerla, I think, uh, but you're allowed to blend in 15% international varieties, the typical ones being Pinot Grigio, Pinot Bianco, and Chardonnay. So that's your blending cuvee. You then undergo triage, the addition of, um, the addition of sugar and also yeast into the, here, not necessarily the bottle, but the tank. And then the process separates. And what you'll do after you've inoculated your tank is you're going to stick it in the tank, right? So you're gonna stick your solution in the tank, and then you're going to pressurize and chill the tank. 
Now, this is generally done in really big containers, not the small romantic barrels that you might think of of uh, champagne or burgundy or California sparkling making, but in really huge uh, truck tank containers. So you take them, you pressurize them, and then you chill them. Then what you've got to do is you've got to clarify them at some point. So you put them through a process, whatever that process is, usually filtration to clarify them. And then you would also then uh, cork and send them out to market. Okay, so how long are they in tank? Well, you can keep them in tank a really short time. Usually you can cut it down to 24 hours and most producers don't let them go much further beyond that and really not much further beyond being done with alcoholic fermentation. There is a little bit of process of dosage I should have added uh, right across there. So they also can receive some dosage right here. Okay, so what are the advantages of the tank method? Well, as you might guess, the tank method is very fast, or as you can see, the tank method is very fast. These wines can sometimes hit a market four months, three months after being harvested. And that's pretty record-breaking time for, that's like Beaujolais Nouveau uh, time frame. So they can get a return on cash very quick. Also, significantly, there's no aging here, so those aromas of yeast and brioche, power and robustness, all the adjectives that I used, don't develop. And for a lot of producers of Prosecco, I uh, have heard, and maybe they'd object to this, but they don't necessarily want them to develop because it's not really what Prosecco is about. So if you don't have that, what you do is preserve the flavors of the base wine and its freshness. So if you have a grape like Gerla that really is about its white flowers, its candy green apple character, its sort of summery sunshine character to it, it preserves, this method preserves all of that. So hopefully that's a way of speaking positive about Prosecco and why they do it. Of course, the other way of looking at it is that it's a really cheap way. Now, I assure you Adami is one of my favorite Prosecco producers and I think this is really wonderful Prosecco, but the tank method is quite frankly, often used to produce massive amounts of bulk sparkling wine. And that's just fine. We all need a mimosa at some point, in this, <laughs> at some point. So, Generally, we don't want to use Veuve Clicquot for our mimosas, and bulk sparkling wine is just fine to do it. Why is it used? It's because however big a container you have, you can turn around that much product in that amount of time, in a very short amount of time. So a great way to make fast sparkling wine, and in enormous quantities. Okay, now that we've got this down, I want to reflect on it and go back through it and talk about some things that winemakers can do, uh, both and maybe viticulturists, vineyard managers can do, and winemaking techniques that change and alter the champagnes. And we're going to use Vilmar to explore this. Vilmar is a producer that I immensely respect. It is indeed in Champagne. They're in the Montagne de Rheim, just north of it. And it's what's known as a small grower of Champagne. I probably could have chosen any US sparkler. Australia has a large sparkling. I shouldn't leave out England. I probably could have chosen any of those. I wanted to do two champagnes though because I thought it would take away some of the variables and just allow us to develop some intellectual tools to then explore the wide world of sparkling wine. Okay, so what's the difference? And one thing I absolutely love is, please at this point, spell these two the two champagnes, smell the uh, Prosecco with them at the same time, go back and forth. And I always have this thing of, some people will tell me on the sales floor, some clients will say, oh, I really can't smell and taste the difference between sparkling wines. You know, they just sparkle and I love to have them in a mimosa and that's kind of it for me. I think here, if you've particularly got them in these glasses, you can tell that these do smell and taste radically different from one another. Well. So why is that? It actually starts with the base wine. Now, if we're starting with the base wine, we can back that up and say that the base wine is made, of course, from grapes. So it also starts with our viticulture. 
in champagne, and I'll, I'll try and make the champagne sh uh, part short so we can do another tasting strictly on champagne. In champagne, the history hasn't always been, a, been about viticulture. It's been about the ability for farmers to sell their grapes to champagne houses, and then the champagne houses bear the burden of making and aging and marketing champagne. So there's been a big separation over the history of champagne uh, between farmers making grapes and houses. In the 1980s and really picking up steam in the 2000s, champagne went under a bit of a revolution of having farmer fizz or small grower houses, people who both grow their own grapes and turn those grapes into champagne. And that's really revolutionary. Along with that comes the idea of you could have monocuvées, meaning you could have single grape varieties represented in a single bottle. Pretty radical. Also along with that comes the idea that was always there in the past but a little bit faded and has translated worldwide, so is the first one, that you could have single vineyard champagnes, sites that were really expressive and important for those. So the base wine has changed and developed over time, and you can explore that worldwide of what makes up the base wine. And some producers have even gone so far if they can explain to you their base wines based on the soil types that they're planted on. So all of the, I guess the summation of that would be all of the things that you would experience as a viticulturalist in making it can take you to the base wine as well here. Now, if we go down and think about the blending cuvee, this is actually fairly complicated, but I think one of the most interesting things you can do and explore. Now, you've already heard that the base wine uh, starts and starts the blending cuvee, and it would be part of the blend. So I should mention that this Vilmar is actually 70% Chardonnay uh, and 30% Pinot Noir, so a flip in contrast between that and our Drapier. Well, what can you do with the blending cuvee? Now, interestingly enough, with the blending cuvee, you can actually do multi-vintage blending cuvees, meaning that champagne oftentimes doesn't have a vintage, a date on it, because it's across multiple vintages. In fact, with this Vilmar, we are tasting a series of vintages, and he generally does three with here 2016 making up 50% of the blend, and then 2015 and 2014 each making up 25% of the blend. So it's a way to, maybe it was a way in the past to, if, if in Champagne or other cool climates you had a bad year, it was a way to rectify that year, but it is also an interesting way to develop this aging factor and have your wines taste more aged. Now with our Drapier, what I could get uh, off of the websites and exploring, and sometimes this information is all very hard to pull out, is that 40% of what's in this Drapier bottle is what's called reserve wines. So let's say if it was based on 16, and it's a recent import into the US, so it might very well be based on 16, 40% of it would come from years prior. Now, you can imagine, you can really get complexity going here. And in fact, one of the houses that I think is very interesting to explore is Krug. Because Krug typically holds for what's known as their multi-vintage, and they really hate it uh, if I was to say their basic cuvee, it, the multi-vintage as opposed to the vintage Krug. But their multi-vintage tends to be a blend of 12 different vintages but those 12 vintages have none of the current. They in fact start six years aged. So if you were to buy a current Krug and it's 2020 right now, the earliest harvest that would be in there was 2014 spanning back to 2002. So really a way to get a lot of expression out of it. Now what is it expressing? Well, it's expressing aged wine like you might age a Cabernet or a Pinot or a Chardonnay, it's expressing that before you put it through this process. So fascinating ways to do it. Now also here, if we move down, triage is 
generally standardized and a lot of high quality growers will use grape must but you can use other sugars. You can also explore this area of aging. So this is where the winemaker has already built the cuvee, put it through secondary fermentation and now it's in bottle. And winemakers with both Trappier and Vilmar, we don't have the 15 months, we have the 36 months of time. So they have a long time post triage that they're aging and sitting there. But some producers will actually have it go much, much longer. And the one that I've mentioned twice already, but it is the most famous, Dom Perignon, is only released after eight years of post triage aging. So again, a very long period of time to be resting, to develop complexity and develop power to it. I just recently had a Jay Schramm from the famous uh, uh, sparkling wine house, Schrammsburg in Napa, that was from the 2008 vintage and spectacular. So it had some age on it too. If we do disgorgement, most of that is not controversial. And again, it's done by machine and most people don't do it differently. But then we reach this area called dosage. Now I can remember when I started selling sparkling wine and really got into small growers 15 years ago, dosage was actually a bit of a controversy. And the controver controversial in champagne that expanded worldwide for the reason that some producers, some tasters, some sommeliers thought that dosage, yes, of course, okay, it's a way for us to uh, ameliorate acidity, but it also can be a way to cover up flaws. The idea being that you can highly dosage a bottle of wine and sugar tends to cover up flaws. Or if not flawed, sugar can cover up really poor quality grapes. This actually became a serious issue in Champagne, again, because of the separation between, in addition to the separation of farmers and houses, because Champagne has the pressure of the world likes it and wants to buy more of it, but it's a demarcated region. And in fact, in I think 2009, they expanded it in order, not for quality reasons, but in order to hit production. So dosage uh, was thought, you know, that's a way to cover up bad grapes. You've got bad base wine or boring base wine, and you simply dosage it more at the end, send it out to market, and there you go. You got an extremely expensive, or you got a high selling product that's really not that great. So the reaction to that was that many small growers started dosaging their champagnes less and less and less. And eventually some of them dropped them down to zero dosage. And the idea, one of the ideas of zero dosage was maybe my fruit quality, my viticultural work in the vineyards is so healthy and so strong that my grapes do not need that additional touch of dosage. Okay, so controversial. I can tell you that the pendulum has swung back. Uh, many of the zero dosage producers made really forcefully acidic champagne that took a long time to age. And I think most are pulling a step back from that and adding a bit of dosage. In fact, one way that I can say to you uh, to explain this is I was once sitting with a champagne maker who were not tasting, but he said, uh, he was a small grower, he said he typically, when doing dosage trials, would take a sample uh, of the champagne, pour it into 65 vials, and then dosage it all at different levels, starting at zero and sometimes going up to 200 grams per liter. And then he would invite friends to taste it blind. And he said it was always funny because there was always one that kind of stood out that everyone thought that level of dosage really brings harmony to the wine. For him, it was odd because at one point, one of his champagnes, and he was a gentleman who really believed in zero dosage, Everyone thought it tasted amazing at 150 grams per liter, which would actually make it incredibly viscously sweet. So it's a fun experiment. If you can do it, if you go to a champagne house, fooling around with the dosage and dosaging your champagnes differently, really interesting to do. Now the final thing here, corking. This one's, of course, not that controversial, except if you reflect back to this aging component or this aging component in the blending cuvee. I've had some growers around the world who insist on aging their wines under cork throughout the entire process. It's more expensive to do 
and it's more oxidative, but they feel it's of higher quality. Not everyone does this, but some people do, and you can fool around with that. Bayresh is the producer we have that does it all under cork throughout and no cap. I should probably mention that here and also here in this aging process, you of course need to stick the liquid into an aging vessel. For many years, stainless steel has been the primary vessel, but producers are now exploring the use of oak as well. So that all changes what can go on here. Okay, so that's our wrap in, or that's, that's our session in exploring the world of sparkling wine. Again, I know it was heavily champagne based, but my hope is that when you come into our stores after tasting these, you can use the questions of what is the base wine and what is the blend cuvee? How high is it disgorged? And you can use that across the world to start exploring and also the different methods like tank to explore all of champagne, all of sparkling wine. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>